A terribly strange bed. The most difficult likeness I ever had to take, not even accepting my first attempt in the art of portrait painting, was a likeness of a gentleman named Faulkner. As far as drawing and colouring went, I had no particular fault to find with my picture. It was the expression of the sitter which I had failed in rendering, a failure quite as much his fault as mine. Mr. Faulkner, like many other persons by whom I have been employed, took it into his head that he must assume an expression because he was sitting for his likeness, and in consequence contrived to look as unlike himself as possible while I was painting him. I had tried to divert his attention from his own face by talking with him on all sorts of topics. We had both travelled a great deal and felt interested alike in many subjects connected with our wanderings over the same countries. Occasionally, while we were discussing our travelling experiences, the unlucky set look left his countenance, and I began to work to some purpose. But it was always disastrously sure to return again before I had made any great progress, or, in other words, just at the very time when I was most anxious that it should not reappear. The obstacle thus thrown in the way of the satisfactory completion of my portrait was the more to be deplored because Mr. Faulkner's natural expression was a very remarkable one. I am not an author, so I cannot describe it. I ultimately succeeded in painting it, however, and this was the way in which I achieved my success. On the morning when my sitter was coming to me for the fourth time, I was looking at his portrait in no very agreeable mood. Looking at it, in fact, with the disheartening conviction that the picture would be a perfect failure unless the expression and the face represented were thoroughly altered and improved from nature. The only method of accomplishing this successfully was to make Mr. Faulkner somehow insensibly forget that he was sitting for his picture. What topic could I lead him to talk on which would entirely engross his attention while I was at work on his likeness? I was still puzzling my brains to no purpose on this subject when Mr. Faulkner entered my studio, and shortly afterwards an accidental circumstance gained for me the very object which my own ingenuity had proved unequal to compass. While I was setting my palette, my sitter amused himself by turning over some portfolios. He happened to select one for special notice, which contained several sketches that I had made in the streets of Paris. He turned over the first five views rapidly enough, but when he came to the sixth, I saw his face flush directly, and observed that he took the drawing out of the portfolio, carried it to the window, and remained silently absorbed in the contemplation of it for full five minutes. After that, he turned round to me and asked very anxiously if I had any objection to part with that sketch. It was the least interesting drawing of the series, merely a view in one of the streets running by the backs of the houses in the Palais Royal. Some four or five of these houses were comprised in the view, which was of no particular use to me in any way, and which was too valueless as a work of art for me to think of selling it to my kind patron. I begged his acceptance of it at once. He thanked me quite warmly. And then, seeing that I looked a little surprised at the odd selection he had made from my sketches, laughingly asked me if I could guess why he had been so anxious to become possessed of the view which I had given him. Probably, I answered, there is some remarkable historical association connected with that street at the back of the Palais Royal, of which I am ignorant. No, said Mr. Faulkner, at least none that I know of. The only association connected with the place in my mind is a purely personal association. Look at this house in your drawing, the house with the water pipe running down it from top to bottom. I once passed a night there, a night I shall never forget to the day of my death. I have had some awkward travelling adventures in my time, but that adventure... Well, well, suppose we begin the sitting. I make but a bad return for your kindness in giving me the sketch by thus wasting your time in mere talk. He had not long occupied the sitter's chair, looking pale and thoughtful, when he returned, involuntarily as it seemed, to the subject of the house in the back street. Without, I hope, showing any undue curiosity, I contrived to let him see that I felt a deep interest in everything he now said. After two or three preliminary hesitations, he at last, to my great joy, fairly started on the narrative of his adventure. In the interest of his subject, he soon completely forgot that he was sitting for his portrait. The very expression that I wanted came over his face. My picture proceeded towards completion in the right direction and to the best purpose. At every fresh touch I felt more and more certain that I was now getting the better of my grand difficulty, 
and I enjoyed the additional gratification of having my work lightened by the recital of a true story which possessed, in my estimation, all the excitement of the most exciting romance. This, as nearly as I can recollect, is word for word how Mr Faulkner told me the story. Shortly before the period when gambling houses were suppressed by the French government, I happened to be staying at Paris with an English friend. We were both young men then, and lived, I'm afraid, a very dissipated life in the very dissipated city of our sojourn. One night we were idling about the neighbourhood of the Palais Royal, doubtful to what amusement we should next betake ourselves. My friend proposed a visit to Frascati's, but his suggestion was not to my taste. I knew Frascati's, as the French saying is, by heart, had lost and won plenty of five-franc pieces there, merely for the fun of the thing, until it was fun no longer, and was thoroughly tired, in fact, of all the ghastly respectabilities of such a social anomaly as a respectable gambling house. For heaven's sake, said I to my friend, let us go somewhere where we can see a little genuine blackguard poverty-stricken gaming, with no false gingerbread glitter thrown over it all. Let us get away from fashionable Frascati's to a house where they don't mind letting in a man with a ragged coat, or a man with no coat, ragged or otherwise. Very well, said my friend. We needn't go out of the Palais Royal to find the sort of company you want. Here's the place just before us, as blackguard a place by all report as you could possibly wish to see. In another minute we arrived at the door and entered the house, the back of which you have drawn in your sketch. When we got upstairs, and had left our hats and sticks with the doorkeeper, we were admitted into the chief gambling room. We did not find many people assembled there, but few as the men were who looked up at us on our entrance, they were all types, miserable types, of their respective classes. We had come to see blackguards, but these men were something worse. There is a comic side more or less appreciable in all blackguardism. Here there was nothing but tragedy, mute, weird tragedy. The quiet in the room was horrible. The thin, haggard, long-haired young man, whose sunken eyes fiercely watched the turning up of the cards, never spoke. The flabby, fat-faced, pimply player, who pricked his piece of pasteboard perseveringly to register how often black won and how often red, never spoke. The dirty, wrinkled old man with the vulture eyes and the darned greatcoat who had lost his last sou and still looked on desperately after he could play no longer, never spoke. Even the voice of the croupier sounded as if it was strangely dulled and thickened in the atmosphere of the room. I had entered the place to laugh. I felt that if I stood quietly looking on much longer, I should be more likely to weep. So, to excite myself out of the depression of spirits which was fast stealing over me, I unfortunately went to the table and began to play. Still more unfortunately, as the event will show, I won. Won prodigiously, won incredibly, won at such a rate that the regular players at the table crowded round me, and staring at my stakes with hungry, superstitious eyes, whispered to one another that the English stranger was going to break the bank. The game was rouge et noir. I had played at it in every city in Europe, without, however, the care or the wish to study the theory of chances, that philosopher's stone of all gamblers. And a gambler, in the strict sense of the word, I had never been. I was heart whole from the corroding passion for play. My gaming was a mere idle amusement. I never resorted to it by necessity, because I never knew what it was to want money. I never practised it so incessantly as to lose more than I could afford, or to gain more than I could coolly pocket, without being thrown off my balance by my good luck. In short, I had hitherto frequented gambling tables, just as I frequented ballrooms and opera houses, because they amused me, and because I had nothing better to do with my leisure hours. But on this occasion it was very different. Now, for the first time in my life, I felt what the passion for play really was. My success first bewildered, and then, in the most literal meaning of the word, intoxicated me. Incredible as it may appear, it is nevertheless true that I only lost when I attempted to estimate chances, and played according to previous calculation. If I left everything to luck, and staked without any care or consideration, I was sure to win. To win in the face of every recognised probability in favour of the bank. At first, some of the men present ventured their money safely enough on my colour, but I speedily increased my stakes to sums which they dared not risk. One after another they left off playing, and breathlessly looked on at my game. 
Still, time after time, I staked higher and higher, and still won. The excitement in the room rose to fever pitch. The silence was interrupted by a deep, muttered chorus of oaths and exclamations in different languages every time the gold was shoveled across to my side of the table. Even the imperturbable croupier dashed his rake on the floor in a French fury of astonishment at my success. But one man present preserved his self-possession, and that man was my friend. He came to my side and, whispering in English, begged me to leave the place, satisfied with what I had already gained. I must do him the justice to say that he repeated his warnings and entreaties several times, and only left me and went away after I had rejected his advice. I was to all intents and purposes gambling drunk, in terms which rendered it impossible for him to address me again that night.